It looks like the top of the hour, so let's begin. Uh, let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to, to the next hour of our conversation. Now, what I just really am very, very excited about is I'd like to welcome this week's guest. Um, Patricia Matthew uh, is an extraordinary person for a whole series of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, she's a scholar of the British Romantic era, uh, which appeals to me because what I did my dissertation on. Um, she's also a scholar who's been working very, very hard on issues of race in the academy. She's the editor of a wonderful book called Written Unwritten, and if you look in the bottom left of your screen, there's a kind of tan-ish colored box. If you click that, you can learn more about the book. Uh, it's a very powerful book about the challenges facing all kinds of scholars of color as they try to navigate the tenure process in higher education. That's the subject for today. And I'm really, really delighted that we have time with Professor Matthew. Greetings. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Can hear you perfectly. Okay. Can you hear and see us? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. Um, I'm so glad that you could make it today. Um, and we have so many questions and topics for you. Oh, my gosh. Um, but my first question I want to ask you is, are you well? Everything's safe and sound? Yes, I am. I am. And I have everything I need inside, so it makes it easier to stay home. True. Yeah. Um, now you're in Brooklyn now, but you're moving to Buffalo. Is that right? No, I was in Brooklyn, and so I'm in Buffalo this year, living in Elmwood. As a, this, one of nine distinguished visiting scholars um, with the Center for Diversity Innovation. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, that's a good honor. Um, and uh, usually on the forum, when I ask people to introduce themselves, I, I ask them to think about the next year ahead and what they're going to be working on. What's these, what are the biggest projects? What are the biggest issues? What's top of mind for you uh, over the next, say, eight months or so? Yeah. So um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Before I say anything, I just have to show tell you that my book is on sale. You wow. the press. It's 40% off. I do this all the time. It's 40% off. And um, if you buy $75 or more, shipping is free. So you could get a copy for yourself, for your dean, for your provost, for that one faculty member at the end of the hall who doesn't seem to get it. Anyway, I just want to start with that um, and thank Brian for having me. I do this all the time. I don't usually hold the book up because I'm usually in an auditorium, but um, I'm in the apartment I'm subletting for the year and I have two copies with me. And so here's one. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm here this year as one of nine visiting scholars with the Center for Diversity Innovation at the University at Buffalo. And we were invited to campus to work on a couple of things at once. One is my book project that I'm writing. It's a romanticist-based project, um, Brian, and it's about British abolitionist literature. And um, it's titled, And Freedom to the Slave, Sugar and the Afterlives of Abolition. So a good chunk of my time is spent working on my book every day. The other reason I'm here is to work with the other fellows and, institute and other SUNY colleges to think about what meaningful diversity and inclusion looks like on, very practical, on a very practical level. So since the book was published in 2016, I've been traveling around the country. I've been going to colleges and universities, talking to institutions about faculty diversity, and also meeting privately with black faculty to talk to them about their experiences on campus. And I think the biggest question on my mind this year is what we mean when we talk about diversity and inclusion and who these things are for. And so while I'm here, I'll be meeting with department chairs and deans and associate deans and provosts from across the SUNY system to think together, right? Usually I come in, I give a talk and then I'm gone in a day or two. Um, being here for the academic year means that I get a chance to sit down and think carefully about what I've been talking about broadly. Um, how do we support faculty of color? Um, what do we actually mean when we talk about inclusion? How are we thinking about diversity in response to the new round of violence against um, Black people and extrajudicial um, 
police violence against black people. What does that mean? Um, when I tweeted about this, I said that I was really curious about the theater of diversity and inclusion. We have all of this rhetoric. Um, George Floyd happened and there was a flood of um, Black Lives Matter statements from institutions, departments, colleges and organizations. And then following that, and I was really happy to see it, following that were statements and declarations by um, uh, mostly by black faculty, but also faculty of color that aim to sort of push, push those conversations beyond or push that beyond simply saying black lives matter. Like what does that mean in a material way for institutions? So that's, that's where I, that's what I'm working on today. That's a lot. And that's it is. I'm busy. <laughs> very, very important. Yeah. And, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Friends, uh, let me explain. If you're new to the forum, uh, the way this works is I begin by teeing off a couple of quick questions. Uh, but my job here is not to be the interviewer. My job is to be the moderator. Your job is to have your own questions and your own thoughts and your own ideas. So as we go, please just go to, you know, again, the bottom strip on the bottom of the screen. Just click either the raised hand if you want to join us on stage or hit the question mark with a question uh, about anything that comes up uh, in the course of our discussion. Uh, this is a community-based forum. It's all about what you're interested in. Uh, so I guess one of the first questions I want to do um, to ask you, um, and you said I could call you Trish. So no, I will no, no. call you Trish. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the questions to ask is, um, where do you see people of color in the academy having the most success in terms of disciplinary fields? So is it mostly in the humanities, the social sciences, the hard sciences? Is there actually a pattern for that? Well, we always know that the STEM disciplines have the biggest challenges. Um, there was a really great article in The Atlantic last year that talked about the fact that there were sort of in 12 fields, there were no new PhDs um, awarded, which means, and most of them were in STEM. Mm -hmm. And so our greatest successes tend to be in the humanities. Um, mm -hmm. Just one more program note. I really want to hear, there are a lot of black women here. Mm -hmm. I really hope that you will feel free to um, ask questions, share your experiences. I know that I'm sort of in this big box, but I also know that any number of you have things to contribute. So please don't feel like it has to just be me. I really think that there are so, it's so rare that we get to have this kind of conversation and the fact that we're on Zoom makes it even more possible. So I'm really, really eager. I wanna hear from everyone, but I'm really eager to hear from black women. Um, so the humanities tend to be the places where I think diversity and not across the humanities, right? I think that there, uh, I think classics struggles, for example, more than maybe English and um, philosophy struggles more than history. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. That's fascinating to think about. Um, and then, I guess thinking about recent history, say thinking about the last 20 years, we've had a lot of academic uh, sound and fury about equity. Uh, you know, we've had the famous Michigan case. Uh, we've had um, different legal challenges about um, uh, admissions. Uh, we've had a lot of high profile hires and programs designed to increase representation, particularly of black, of Latino and uh, indigenous people. And yet progress is, is so slow um, or non-existent at times. Mm -hmm. Before we get to COVID, what's uh, holding this back? How can we, how can we're still looking like the 1960s or 70s? Well, I think a, we tend to collapse diversity, faculty diversity, and student diversity. So our our measuring sticks tend to be different. Um, legal cases tend to be about admissions, for example. Um, I think the Michigan four that you're referring to, those are the four women of color at the University of Michigan who all had joint appointments um, in a program that I, I'm forgetting the name of the program. And then they had appointments in more traditional departments. And there were five people up for tenure that year, um, four women of color and one white man, and all four women of color were denied tenure and the white man wasn't. Um, and it sparked um, it sparked a letter campaign and a really powerful one day symposia um, to think about what was wrong, right? How do, you, how do you make that decision? And how come no one in seeing that thought, wait a minute, 
this is a pattern. <laughs> it's, if it's one person every couple of years, but if it's the same people every year that are being denied tenure, then you have a problem on your hands. And I think the problem, one of the problems is that institutions might be good at recruiting faculty of color. Um, and I'm going to say black faculty more. I think one of the first things we have to do is stop collapsing everyone under one label. Yeah. Right? I think it's a mistake. Um, one thing I like about the book and I'm proud of about the book is that it's not just black faculty, it's Asian American faculty, it's South Asian faculty, it's Latinx faculty. Um, and so it's one way, it's one thing to recruit black faculty. It's another thing to understand what they need when they arrive on campus and how to offer them, and I use the term mentorship, but I don't necessarily mean official mentorship, but how to help them make the best choices so that they can be productive in the field that they were hired in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also feel like they can build on their research agendas. agendas. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that when people talk about diversity, they're often talking about what the institution needs from having a diverse faculty. And that is very different than what faculty of color who compromise, right, that diverse faculty need to get their work done. Hmm. So um, I remember a really great conversation. It was kind of intense, but I had with a university president who called me up. He said, you know, Tricia, I want to talk to you about um, faculty hiring. Our students want black faculty. We've had some racial incidents on campus. And so I want to hire more black faculty. And I said, are you going to pay them more for fixing your problem? Right, because they love institutions, presidents, provosts, they love to bring black faculty in and ask them almost immediately to address some crisis. But when the time comes for tenure review, for reappointment, tenure review and promotion, none of that works. Count. None of that work counts. And all too often their white colleagues are perfectly fine letting them do that work while they continue to do the work that forwards their careers and doing the work that the institution values. And so the message gets sent that you're here for one thing, but we're gonna value something else. And I think at first that can be really appealing um, to black new black faculty. I think they understand the problems. They, they have the language, they're much more sophisticated, you know, than all of us who've been here for a while are, and they get there. And I think this is, this is work that feels immediate. It's really like there's houses on fire. And I'm gonna come in and try to put that fire out. And where institutions fail is in making clear that that fire has been there for a while. Mm -hmm. So the thing I always say when I talk to black faculty is that your job is to get tenure your job is not to fix your institution's diversity problems. Mm -hmm. Those problems were there before you arrived and they'll be there after you're denied tenure. Um, I think the other problem is that the work that black faculty do in their fields of specialization often aren't valued by their peers. So they can be in a department working diligently and doing very well, but if their peers don't understand or respect the field that they're in, it beca instantly becomes very isolating. Um, I think the other problem is that there is a sense that because we have these myths around hiring and diversity, people are not as invested, not always, by the way, these are broad statements, right? But too often people are not as invested in keeping black faculty because the idea is they A, they're going to leave, that they can just wave their CVs out the window and research one jobs will come, you know, flocking to them. So the care that they give to one another or the effort that they extend to one another isn't always there. Um, and then one more thing, I think there's a, I think about this a lot because I travel around to different um, institutions in different towns. So I teach at Montclair State University. I live in Brooklyn. Um, I'm very happy I get to live in Brooklyn. I can, you know, live my life and find other kinds of people whose lives look like mine. But if you're hired into a department where the social life of the department is around, or the life, the, your social life in a depart, uh, in your home is rooted in what happens in the department, it can be really isolating if your life doesn't look like the life that your colleagues enjoy, right? So when we talk about fit, for example, mm -hmm. it's very rarely about whether people can do the work or they're teaching. It really is, do we see them as someone, we have this idea that we're all friends here, right? That we're just some sort of intellectual family or community. Um, I interviewed a woman who was at the university, a uh, university in I a university in Iowa, who said, you know, she was there without her partner and her teenage son, and she was expected to spend the weekends socializing with her colleagues. And it just wasn't who she was. 
And it's in those spaces where people talk about what's actually happening and sort of the casual trade of ideas and strategies. And so she was she was, she pulled herself out of that, but also didn't realize the extent to which it was curtailing her understanding of the institution. Fantastically rich answered my to my uh, question. I'm so glad. Um, thank you. Uh, you'll, you'll see in the chat box, people are saying, preach, you know, they're really- oh, I can't see the chat box, so good. I'll, I'll tell you, don't worry. Yeah. And call me out if I miss something, really. Well, we, we do have some, some questions that come up. Um, mm -hmm. And so let me just uh, flash one of these on the screen. This is from uh, Michelle, please forgive me, Professor Soto Pena, Pena if I mispronounced your name. Uh, I'm gonna guess this is assistant professor Michelle Soto Pena uh, from CSU Stanislaus. Um, and uh, she asks, let me flash this on the screen so you all can see this. Um, I'm interested in how in, uh, uh, institutes of higher education are working towards recruiting and training uh, BIPOC populations without reproducing cultural taxation. Yeah, not well. <laughs> They're not doing it well. And I think it's that, that cultural taxation, which I take to mean the idea that they're expected to do more work and there are all of the assumptions about what they're there to do. Um, my advice is, especially in a year where people may not have as many opportunities to hire because they're either hiring freezes, I think that's the main reason, or departments are struggling. I think that, in, I think that departments have to do their homework. This seems to me a good, in, it's hard with everything else going on, but this seems to me, instead of the work of writing lines for ten, you know, requesting tenure lines or mm -hmm. going through the work of hiring, to spend time um, reading and trying to understand what it is that colleagues of color need when they join a department. I don't think this can be taught through implicit bias training. I don't think it can be taught in diversity workshops. I think it has to happen in small, meaningful conversations. And I think faculty about um, equitable and inclusive workplaces. In other words, I, you know, I, I sometimes think there are all of these climate studies where people talk about how black people or people of color experience the institution. And then white faculty, when they fill out those, those same forms are talking about how much time they spend on research, what materials they need to be successful in the classroom. I would love an honest climate study to find out where the resistance to diversity and inclusion um, happens, right? Like what's behind, because it's so easy to say it's racist or it's institutional racism. And those things are true, um, but there's like almost a caricature of what that looks like. Um, I'm really, I really think institutions have to do more work to figure out where faculty, and I keep saying faculty, I, I wanna talk maybe a little bit about where I think mentorship should happen. So maybe we can talk about that. But I would say particularly with faculty who are responsible for setting the tone for how new faculty see themselves in the department and what they see their obligation is, because I think people think diversity is important, but it's not a high priority. And so it's projected as a high priority, but then in the work that goes into hiring, um, it's not, it's not granted the same status. And um, I think that what ends up happening is two things. One, um, because there aren't a lot of tenure line faculty hires, right? It's really hard to get a tenure line, especially if you're in the humanities. If you only get one or two every couple of years, people instantly can become more conservative about that one resource. <laughs> Right, so the very first thing, and I'm saying this everywhere I can at Buffalo, is there have to be more tenure line hires. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even saying cluster hires are the goal. Like I've listened to a lot of really wise senior black women. There's no silver bullet, but if you're not hiring tenure line faculty, then you can't hire faculty well and you can't actually support diversity. And something, I, and Brian, I actually would love, I think you know more about this than I do. I mean, thinking about how institutions count what faculty do in order to determine whether or not they get tenure lines. So they don't get credit for how many students they teach, for example, departments get credit for how many majors they have, right? That's what it's like at my institution. Those are different numbers altogether. Um, so we rely, we rely on this adjunct base of contingent faculty that's always in this awful place of precarity. So clearly we need people to teach our students, right? So I, I think that, I hope that, well, I know that institutions have to reevaluate how they're determining who gets tenure lines and strategizing so that faculty don't feel like we only get one chance, right, 
Because if you think that your black faculty member is going to leave after two years, then you're not going to want to hire a black faculty member. Right. Because then you might lose the line. Yeah. Right. You might, there's resentment. This idea of black faculty mobility is a cause of resentment. Um, a woman was quoted in um, Sarita C was writes in my book that as she was going through her tenure denial, a white woman colleague said to her, well, you'll just swan off to some other great job as if that wasn't going to cost Sarita C time, energy, community, the psychic energy of um, moving, never mind the horror of being denied tenure. But th if that's the assumption, it's really difficult, I think, to embrace faculty when they're there and pay attention to their needs when they express them. Oh, that's that's an excellent point. There, there's all kinds of metrics that, that we use in higher ed in the US right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, uh, before I dive into that, uh, let me just relay, so many questions are coming up all over the place, uh, which is great. Um, and uh, one more is to come in from uh, uh, Kimberly uh, at uh, Remote Learning Solutions. And uh, Kimberly asks, how does your work affect the power and actions of unseen decision makers, such as white women administrative assistants, EJ? Um, oh, I guess I can close, can I close the box so I can see you again? Yes. Um, well, I think that that, I think that that, um, I think that problem is not as invisible as it used to be. Mm. Right. It mm. is in spaces where there are no white people. The obstacle that faculty of color talk about the most is the white women they have to negotiate with and around. Hmm. And sometimes at every level, hmm. whether it's administrative assistants, whether it's their colleagues in the department, um, women's studies has a mess on its hand and a reckoning that I think is happening. It's a long time coming. I mean, when Audre Lorde called out white women in 1970s for not understanding the way that they were oppressing their women faculty, I mean, their, their black sisters, this is a long problem. Um, and here's what, so part of my like daily life or weekly life is an email, um, a DM on Twitter, a request to talk to me, and someone will say, I'm having a problem with X. And it was it's normally a white woman. And so often they'll say, and her name is actually Karen. And it's just like, it's just, that's the, that's, she's, her, she's literally, she is a Karen and her name is actually Karen. And so um, I, I try in longer conversations to make really explicit that white women have to understand that they have a position on the sort of racial and gender hierarchy that requires them to be mindful that what they are demanding of or asking of or the way they treat their black um, colleagues and the faculty they work with, they have to be as mindful. Um, but I used to, I mean, when I started the book, in fact, the question was um, one of the Michigan women was denied tenure. And one of the question was if she had allowed herself to be mentored by her white female colleagues. And I, and I instantly started hearing, the first thing I started hearing, and people were very reluctant to put this in writing, was that there was an expectation that they had to serve, and this is also what my book is about, the book I'm writing now, mm -hmm. is they had a very particular relationship they were supposed to have with their white women colleagues, where their feelings and their goals and their understandings of themselves were centered to every conversation, even as those white women professed to be con um, committed to diversity, racial, interested in um, social, racial justice. Um, there's a really great essay, um, I'm gonna forget the author's name because I'm a little bit nervous, but it's called On Being Lovingly, Knowingly Ignorant. <laughs> and it really discusses the way that white women in the academy perform a particular kind of oppression that gets masked, um, or often, not anymore, I think the mask has been pulled back, but is, um, so often under the guise of a moral compunction to do a certain kind of work. Um, so I'll stop there, but I, it is a question that comes up more and more, and I'm really glad to see it getting more um, attention. Uh, Kimberly, that's a fantastic question. Um, and um, let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can bring you up on stage. Let's see if all the, uh, um, let's see if your camera is working. Give us a second here. A special sound effect. Sure. Um, no, it's not working right now. I'm going to circle back uh, and try that later. Um, Kimberly, thank you for a really, really great question. And again, thank you, Trish, for a really meticulous answer. Um, I'm going to try and share a citation for that Mariano Ortega piece, uh, which is a fantastic title. 
Um, we have several questions just coming in all over the place. And this is from, uh, um, here's one from a great friend of the program from Raj at SUNY Old Westbury, who asks, is the dearth of diversity in STEM fields a barriers to entry or lack of pathways? Or what are some of the most common barriers to entry your research has identified? So um, I'll confess that my research does not did not um, begin in STEM field because I'm a humanities person and I wanted to stay in my wheelhouse. Um, Baronda Montgomery is here and I would love to hear from Baronda if you wanna bring her up because she could speak to this um, much more effectively than I can. Um, recruitment is a problem. Assumptions about what people are capable of is a problem. Um, there is the role model problem, right? You can't be what you, it's hard to be what you can't see. I think that it starts long before um, faculty hiring. Um, and is she here? And there's also, I just want to, I, I do want to, I want to kick this to her because I just think that she has done amazing, amazing work. And I think she just got promoted at Michigan State University where she's actually going to think about these. I'm, I'm chatting with her right now. Ask her. Okay, great, great. And she's a professor and assistant VP of research at Michigan State University. Yeah. I'm putting her on the spot, but while we're waiting for her, um, one thing I would like to maybe address, is that okay, Brian? Please, please go ahead. Yeah. But I do want to hear from, so like, even if it takes me off the stage to put her on, because I think she has really useful things to offer. Um, and I think that's, I, I think there's, um, I, want to, I want to point people to a couple of hashtags that are about STEM. I've really loved, it seems like there's been a concerted movement for the past couple of months for different people in different STEM fields, black people particularly, to just introduce themselves and the work that they do. So mm -hmm. as so often is the case, um, social media is a really great place um, for those conversations to start. And I don't wanna speak out of turn or try to flatten out what they're doing. Um, one of the things I think, well, maybe I'll just take another question because while we're, maybe Baranda will wanna chime in. Well, I'm, I've uh, Baranda doesn't have access to video right now. Okay. Too. Uh, so I, I've asked her if she wants to type in anything, and if she can, <laughs> I'll flash on the screen. All right, Miranda, I just put you on the spot like that. <laughs> this is what happens when romanticists are pedagogic. You know, they, they, <laughs> we had um, a question from uh, Virginia Commonwealth University from Kim Case, who's director of faculty success there. Uh, and uh, Kim asks, what programs and support would you like to see from faculty development efforts? One area I would like to focus, those who evaluate faculty. Yes. Yeah. That's my, that's a good, I love that question. So, um, so one, I think that there has to be more transparency, obviously, but I've been exploring, and this is based in part because of, I suddenly started real, no, I didn't, yeah, I realized that I needed to start talking more to administrators. Mm -hmm. And every time I would get to sit down with a dean or associate dean, I was struck by how clear they were on what they want from faculty crystal clear. It was not opaque. There was no written, unwritten, like really explicitly clear. Um, and every time I was counseling somebody who had had a tenure denial and was writing an appeal, after they had spoken to their dean, it was also crystal clear what they should have done. Hmm. And what it has me thinking is that we put a lot of pressure on department chairs to guide new faculty through hmm. the tenure process. Hmm. And the pressures on them are enormous already. Um, just they have to do more, I think, than they've ever had to do before. It seems to me that an effective associate dean or a dean that makes time in the calendar to sit down and have a conversation, a pre-tenure conversation with faculty would be doing a huge service to the institution and to the faculty member um, themselves. Because what they get are two different messages, right? The, the thing you're told is don't take on too much committee work. And that's the advice. That's it. That's it. Learn to say no. I was repeating that advice, by the way. And then young black women assistant professors were telling me, Tricia, we can't wait. Right. Ferguson happened and they didn't feel like they could wait till they had tenure to address it. Um, and since deans, particularly deans, are responsible for the vision of the college, they should set time aside to make that um, transparent to help faculty think about how they can how they should participate in it. Um, there's a chapter in the book that I think it might be the most useful for administrators because it, it approaches a tenure case from the position of a department chair and a dean 
trying to help a young black professor balance the need for research with her commitment to activism. So, I'm sorry. Which one is that? That's April Few. There are about three or four. It's it's the only essay in the book that was actually published as an article before. So you can actually have, you can see it in the book, but also you can just um, find the article. But this idea that, so that's what I want to see. I want to see more senior administrators having frank conversations um, with small groups of faculty of color, looking at their CVs. They know what they're looking for. They know how they're reading it. The most, the most sort of transformative conversation I had um, after actually was after I got tenure was a senior administrator sat down with me and was frustrated with me the way you are with a bright student who you think should get a thing. And he said, Tricia, you've done this great thing here. Why are you burying it whenever you talk about what you've accomplished? And I didn't know that I was doing it wrong. In other words, I was doing myself a disservice, not because I wasn't doing the work, but because I wasn't sure how to frame it. And nobody thought to tell me that. Uh, right. So faculty development and that work is not just about, you know, work life balance, even though that's important. It's not just saying no, helping people figure out how to present their work in a way that makes it legible to the people who are going to evaluate them seems super important. And it helps people make better choices. Right. There was the, there were those two cases at UVA, um, Paul Harris, who successfully had a tenure appeal. And when I was reading about it, what was, what was maddening to me, and this was a STEM issue, is one young man was denied tenure because he wasn't the PI, the principal investigator, on a grant. And I thought, wait a minute, if that's the standard, tell a person. Just be, a, you can be clear about that, right? There are things that we all know. We all know in this room that refereed work is here. We know that, but we don't always know what kind of refereed work matters. And we end up going, you know, we end up basing it on somebody who was tenured 10 years earlier, or everyone sort of looks at research institutions and then they kind of, you know, kind of scale back, scale down based on their own institution. But deans and provosts know what they want because they read all the files, they know what they're looking for and they can flag problems. So I think they have a moral imperative to do that, to be super clear. I don't think everyone should get tenure, by the way. I think everybody should know what they need to do in order to get tenure. That's a different thing. That's it's a, a different thing. Everyone should have a fair shot and understand the work they're doing. Uh, well, just two quick notes. First of all, if I could ask a favor of anybody in the audience, um, I'm having a problem with two of my computers. I can't get a good screenshot. Uh, if anyone has a nice screenshot of all these wonderful faces up here, if you just send it to me, however you can, I would appreciate it. I can do it. Um, I'm, I'm going up beating on two different computers instead of... Um, uh, now, also, Kimberly, I finally managed to get the video working for you. So here she is. Hello. Yay. Hi, Kimberly. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for, um, I had a question earlier about the administrative assistance and I wanted to follow up. Thank you for your answer. That was very helpful. Um, and so the place that that came, that conversation or that question came from is that oftentimes the administrative assistants are proxies uh, with power. And so I know you talked about having conversations with department heads and with deans, um, but oftentimes the administrative assistants stands in for those people mm -hmm. and, and effectively becomes um, decision makers. Yeah. And what I've seen happen is um, in many cases, them equating themselves mm -hmm. with the same status as a person who's on the faculty. Um, and then also, I know you said earlier that um, the awareness that a lot of white women have that, um, that they have to be, reminding them of their commitment to to justice and and um, and being supportive of uh, black faculty and faculty of color in these situations. But with the administrative assistance, yeah. there may not be this same level of commitment to justice. Yeah. You're so right. can you address my mm -hmm. big all those points kind of together? <laughs> yeah, it is. A, I mean, it is a problem because they have a great deal of power. Right. You know, it can be whether or not they tell you where information you need is or how they answer your questions or how they pass your request up the line. Um, I wish I had a quick and easy answer for that. I think that um, I think it's a com I, my sense is that 
all of this depends on, they will do what the leadership signals mm -hmm. to them, mm -hmm. right? So I think it becomes really important for people who to whom they answer, and I don't even mean that as a in a supervisory way, but they're gonna they sh they will follow the lead, um, hopefully or somewhat follow the lead of the people that they that they're reporting to, um, and this is something because I don't address it in the book because it's a book about faculty hiring, sure. and then uh -huh. but, but ironically also because this is a kind of personal note, all of the administrative assistants I've worked with. Um, mm -hmm. And administrators, those who assist administrators, I should say, have been amazing black women. Mm -hmm. And I say this, they've saved my butt a lot. Sure. Yes. And sometimes <laughs> it's simply by telling me I'm doing the right thing, right? You know, I'll be handling some thing that's outside of my, you know, the thing I know how to do. And just a quick bug in my ear, oh, kiddo, you know, talk to this person or, that, or not that person that just signals to me that I'm not alone in that. So I've been mm -hmm. personally very spoiled and it's not something that's come up in the conversations I've had, except that I do, re I do know that um, almost, every, I, I, almost every successful black academic I know has a story like that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where somebody at the administrative level who's handling paperwork help them in some way. Mm -hmm. And saw themselves as responsible for helping, you know, the young black faculty who are just trying to make it through. That's a really there's an article or or an op ed piece in that to be written. Not to put more work on you, but there's <laughs> not work that people talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it's it. There are a lot of subtleties that go along with that. Um, and right, and it can work both ways. So it can be like, oh my God, you know, here's a black faculty member and I really want her to succeed. So it can work that way. And then it can work the other way. So like if a lot of these colleges are in very small towns yes, and small towns where most of the staff come from a local white population. yes, And so they decide who comes and who goes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and also they have a staying power that a lot of faculty don't have. Yeah, they're good. They were there before we got there and they'll be there. When exactly. We, and, right. they they know where, the, and they know everything. And it's, I mean, in a lot of instances, they actually run the office. Yes. Right. Yes. That, they, that they're that they're sort of accountable for. And two, there's an S. I'm mean, really I think there's some work to be done that that could start mm -hmm. with like a personal essay or even a panel at a professional organization to talk about it. Um, that seems like something that really needs to be explored more carefully than I can do here. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and I, I want to this is not quite a question so much as just a statement is that I've seen situations where there's a man uh, in power who has an administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. And when people come around and they talk about diversity, they talk about inclusion and men and men and women. Um, and these people are all on board, but the administrative assistant does the dirty work for them. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like your point about the about the cultural gap between who gets hired into institutions and who gets hired to make sure those institutions keep running. Right, mm -hmm. if you're mm -hmm. from the town, that's a different di that's a different dynamic mm -hmm. than it is when you're yeah. And then just of course the tension of feeling that you know if you're a black faculty member and you're working with a white working with a white administrator who might feel some sort of way about yeah. having to answer to or quote unquote yes. assist someone who outside in the outside of the institution she might think of as lower on the lower on the status scale mm -hmm. yeah. yeah thank you i appreciate that yeah, well, we really appreciate you can really that was a very penetrating question i've and never had a question quite like that really i'm glad to get it excellent uh, well what well, the forum does well is we have brilliant brilliant folks who ask great questions um, and we have speaking of which we have more questions coming in uh and here's one from uh, sarah san gregorio uh, who uh, I believe was actually at Montclair for some time. Okay. I might be wrong about that. And she's a wonderful person. She says, with the pandemic, there are lots of questions around the tenure process being impacted. Mm -hmm. Do you think this could possibly impact BIPOC faculty at a much higher level? And what can we do as colleagues? Yeah. I like the last part of that question. What we, Yes, right. If COVID is disproportionately hitting Black and Latin black communities, that means that their caregivers and family members and mothers and fathers and sisters have to carry that burden while they're trying to teach and do their research during COVID. 
Um, I think that the best thing that colleagues who want to support, they have to ask um, their administrators how they're treating the tenure clock and understand that stopping it and starting it is not, I'm going to use a Jurassic Park metaphor, the first Jurassic Park, when they restarted the park and they said, you can't just flip a switch and you had to go all the way across the compound. Then you had to put all these switches on and it took a while. It didn't happen instantly. And then, you know, he got eaten by the velociraptor, right? It's not an easy thing. So <laughs> it's not just enough to say, let's pause the tenure clock and then we're gonna unpause or, or you know, start it up again. Yeah. Um, I think I'm afraid the answer is not an easy one because institutional habits change. I mean, are very difficult to change. And it's so clear to so many people. And I say this because I'm have the um, I'm not teaching right now, right? I'm on leave this year. It's so clear to me that too many administrators do not understand the pressures of teaching in COVID. I think if they understood it, they would be making. I'd love to think. I hope if they understood it, they would be making better decisions. And so I think there has to be a lot of collective action and a lot of pressure put um, on uh, deans to make really clear how they're going to assess and, and what they're going to expect. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer. For some people asking for a delay in the tenure clock makes sense for other people, but we don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, you know, if, they're, if people start furloughing or firing faculty, then you put yourself at risk in that way. Um, some people are close to tenure, and so it might make sense to apply for tenure, to apply for early, atten for early tenure. Um, but I do think that the I do think that the most important thing is that um, faculty are are feel well feel comfortable talking to the people who are going to make the decisions. Um, it would seem to me that any these the committee the sort of the tenure committee outside the department level it would seem to me that they should collectively have conversations about what they are going to do because we have to really get past the idea that standards are fixed and neutral. Mm. Right, so like, oh, should we lower our standards because of COVID? Well, you made them up before COVID, make them up a different way, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't think it's not easy, but sometimes we're holding to some fantasy of what people were doing to begin with. And we're so afraid that if we, you know, if we take the boot off of someone's neck, they're not gonna work anymore. I think you have to really think carefully. And also, I mean, this is not gonna happen. I know that it's pie in the sky thinking. I think institutions are gonna have a different kind of accounting as we move through whatever's next with COVID. I don't think we just, co we have a vaccine and then people aren't sick and then we go back into the classroom in the same way and we go back to our research in the same way. I think that things are gonna change. And I think part of thinking about that change has to include um, thinking about um, how we tenure people and I think we have to really be smart about it and know that if it's good for a faculty of color, it's good for everyone. In other words, everyone's facing this crisis, right? I, I read and, and listen to um, everyone, white women, even white men dun, 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 are facing real challenges because of COVID. So it's actually really collectively better for everyone, for people to be, um, to think about how we can be more sane about what we expect faculty produ faculty to produce in the classroom, right, in their own research. Um, some people are getting research done during COVID, but if your institution and your faculty are no longer spending that magic 40% of their time, and you know they're spending 60 to 70% of their time, then maybe go back and look at your how you're going to evaluate them or how you're going to, and when I say compensate, not necessarily fiscally, even though I'm always for giving people money to get their work done, how are you going to adjust your understanding of their contributions to the university's mission? Because the university's mission seems to have changed in the last six months. We had a, a, a few different quick comments just floating out. I just want to share these because they're, they're really sharp. And one of them, just so you know, Kim Case, who asked a question before, she noticed um, the Godzilla behind you. So I just wanted to say, if you're doing Jurassic Park and dinosaurs, I just want to make sure we all saw Kojiro there, just, just being awesome. Uh, we had a uh, Eric Fournier mentioned, uh, they're talking about automatically extending the tenure clock to help faculty avoid the stigma of asking for an extension. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda Dobbs said, let me see if I get this right, I'm having a learning community on retention of faculty of color, and I think we need to think of all the support structure 
love the idea of deans reviewing carefully and individually with faculty their CVs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one more, uh, oh, Tony V. Hanford says, it's way beyond tenure, it's promotion, it's sabbatical, it's reports on sabbaticals, on and on. Um, so I wanted to just share all those really. Oh, and then one quick question from, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't I didn't quite see who asked this. They just want to know if they can buy your book from Amazon or if they have to get it from the uh, publisher directly. You can buy it from Amazon. There you, you go. You could buy it from UNC Press because it's 40% off. It's hard to miss a 40% <laughs> off. It's also open access if you don't want to, you know, if you just want to pick a chapter. Um, the University of South Dakota did an amazing thing for any deans or provosts here, they bought copies of the book for a lot of people. Nice. And the institution read the book um, together and chairs read it in reading groups and faculty read it in reading groups and staff and deans. And then they, um, and I went, I went and gave a talk and it was, I found it was really useful, but I love that idea. And people who talked to me meant that they were having the conversation across the different parts of the institution that have to come together. And they've made some, I've just heard recently that they made some, they made some important changes to how they assess faculty. And I think it has a lot to do with the two young women, I say young women, the two assistant professors who organized that. Um, so that's something that you can do. It's not that expensive, like, you know, no, um, bottle of wine, that's a good one. Um, Tiffany, uh, Tiffany Hollis, Dr. Tiffany Hollis asks uh, how you get the 40% off. Is it a promo code or something? Like that? Yeah, yeah. So if you just go to the website, to UNC Press's website, it says it's off American Lit, but they mean all of their books. Okay. Yeah. So take a look at that and uh, let us know if you have any if you have any issues. We also have, just, just so you know, just for a personal moment here, mm -hmm. I did my dissertation on doppelgangers in the Romantic era. And I, I've completely resisted bringing this up, but... <laughs> Somebody here has forced my hand. Uh, <laughs> County Community College, which I believe is not too far from you, yeah. uh, the chief information officer, whose name is Trisha, asks a question. So here's your doppelganger right hey, now. Hey, Trisha. Let me, let me just put this up. Uh, and Trisha says, thank you for speaking today, Dr. Matthew. As a white woman named Trisha, what's the number one thing I can do to make a real change? And let me be, be clear. Trisha's identifying as the chief information officer. So this is a question at least for technology, yes. but also for the library. Also for the library. It might be. I, some, in some institutions, those two are linked together. Yeah. I don't um, know they are. Yeah. So my, the first advice is going to sound really funny. Listen to black faculty. So just ask them what they want and need and tell them that you'll listen and really just take it in and then figure out what you can do. So often people want to have me in to talk to them about their diversity issues. Black faculty across the country are writing statements. UNC Chapel Hill faculty have done it. Johns Hopkins University History Department has done it. Um, SUNY, this um, black faculty across the SUNY network have done it. They know what they need. If you're an information, and if you're working with the library, I will I will brag about what our librarian did at the beginning of the George Floyd before she put together an amazing resource of materials that address the um, address the issue from multiple angles. Right, I just so admire the work that happens in information um, system works and studies and. Um, and she highlighted the work of the faculty who were already doing the work, right? I think the other challenge is so often people, institutions look outside for advice and suggestions and recommendations for what to do when the people who are on there, and they know it better than an outsider would, right? You can hire a consultant, but the black faculty who are there understand the institution at a granular level. And so asking specifically what they need and being clear about the resources you have um, I think that, and, and really high, and, and I mean it, amplifying the work that black faculty do in all of the ways that they do it. Um, and if, if there's, if you're in a room and the issue of service comes up, pressing the need to have that rewarded in some material way so that it can make, so it can make life easier for black faculty who also have their other work to do, right? That double load is never gonna go away. As long as there's racism in the world. <laughs> That double load is never going to go away, but you can make it lighter by providing material material support 
for black faculty who have to do it. That's a fantastic, fantastic way to, to close. Uh, Trisha Clay, uh, thank you for your question for Trisha Matthew. Um, that's fantastic. Um, we have uh, people in the chat who are saying, yes, um, you know, Amplify is very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a certain Greg Britton, who is uh, um, the head of Johns Hopkins, says book clubs are a great idea. And let me just say, if there's anything I can do to help with the virtual book club, I'm happy to host, as, as you can see here. Hi, Greg Britton. Um, and um, there is also, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to, I believe, Professor Carrie Sinanen. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, who is a faculty member at UT uh, San Antonio, I think, um, who uh, says uh, over on Twitter, uh, this is important to have. Diversity needs to shift from asking what the institution needs to asking what do black faculty need to get their work supported. Mm -hmm. And are you going to pay them more to fix your problems? Um, we have unfortunately run into the greatest problem of all for this hour, which is we are out of time. Uh, we have raced through uh, in, a, in an hour with an incredible amount of questions, uh, and and Trisha, you've been fantastic as, as a guest. I'm just so you you've raised so many ideas so clearly. You've engaged with our questioners so beautifully. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just delighted um, that you've been able to join us, and I'm joined by people in the chat who are just saying thank you, thank you, thank you. People thank are you all so much. Thank you, thank you. I really this was really uplifting. One quick question for you. What's the best way for everyone to keep up with you? Is, is Twitter the best or do you- Twitter's the best, yeah. So I'm at Trisha Matthew, two T's, no S. Um, I have a website. Oh, I have a website. It's new, patriciamatthew.com. And um, it's mostly where I just list what I'm doing and have done, but I'm gonna be doing more work there. So yeah, but follow me on Twitter. I'm there a lot and I often post new articles and um, essays on diversity in higher education. Elsie uh, Solis Chang says, thank you, Dr. Matthew. Still thankful for your message today. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, please do your, your great work at Buffalo. Stay warm this winter because you'll get that fabulous wind coming right over the great. So bad, so bad uh, already. And of course, keep up the fantastic work and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. This was really, this was really great to do. Thanks. Thanks right. for the invitation. But don't go away, friends. Uh, just to you know, give you a quick note about the next few weeks uh, of the program. And let me again, thank you all for uh, just a great, great conversation. Uh, looking ahead, just let me let you know that we have a whole bunch of different topics coming up, uh, including a session on pedagogy, a session on accrediting agencies, a session on admissions, educational technology, work, life, COVID balance, all that's coming up. Uh, we're, of course, continuing this conversation through social media. Uh, just use the hashtag FTTE so that we can find it. Um, if you'd like to go back into our previous sessions, including sessions that deal with tenure in general, as well as with uh, black academics, as well as racism, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, and you can find more than 200 sessions back there. Uh, above all, all of you, as I just said to our wonderful guest, please stay safe. Uh, this is uh, an extraordinary time, and uh, I really, really hope all of you are safe, sound, and well. In the meantime, We'll see you online next time. Bye-bye.